unfortunately. Um, Alexander, his background with Aristotle, as we said before, um, that uh, was a really good thing for him, uh, being educated then. He crosses over into Turkey at the Granicus River, not important, but basically, and defeats the Persians up by Troy. And uh, so he comes across the northern part down into Turkey and defeats the Persians in 334, his first big victory there at the Granicus River. Uh, what's interesting to me is that after he defeats the Persians, he doesn't chase after them. He actually says, hey, I'm, I'm over here, and Troy is just right over here, and he's never been to Troy. And so Alexander goes over and visits Troy, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and all that kind of stuff, Achilles and things. He pays honor to, to, to Troy, and so Alexander takes time out, goes over and visits Troy, and rather than chasing after the Persians directly. He also is brilliant in that he takes all the cities along the coast of Asia Minor or Turkey. He goes down the coastline and takes all the coastal cities. That way the Persians can't send boats to cut off his supply lines. Very brilliant move. Alexander takes the coastal towns. The Persians can't cut off his supply lines then. And he's able to keep the, you know, the straw of supplies coming to his troops because of the way, rather than pursuing the, the Persians exactly. He comes over to Issus. Issus is kind of right where uh, Turkey meets with uh, Syria, right at the corner of the, Mes of, of the Mediterranean, the northeastern north, uh, corner. He defeats the Persians again at Issus in 333, and this is where I pull the date from Alexander, 333, this victory at Issus. Now, as he's over by Turkey in the corner there, what he does first, he doesn't just chase after the Persians back over to Persia, Iran, and Iraq and that. What he does is he goes down into Egypt first. And why is that smart? He doesn't want the Persians to be able to sneak around his back and take, take his back out. So he's got to cover his back. So what he does is he goes down to Egypt first before he goes after the Persians over in Mesopotamia. So he defeats them in Isis and then goes down, heads down south. As he's going down south, he comes down through Lebanon, and where Syria and Lebanon are, just north of Israel, and he comes to the city of Tyre. Now, the city of Tyre had had some prophecies in Ezekiel chapter 26. The prophet Ezekiel had said that Tyre would be made flat as a pancake. The city of Tyre would be flattened, and the fishermen would spread their nets there. It would be so flat. Well, now you ask, in the ancient world, when a king destroys a city, usually they torch the city, they burn it down, and they kill the people. And the city is left in ruins. A, a king is not going to take the time and effort to flatten the city. So usually the cities are torched, they're burned, the people are killed, and the king moves on, and you have all these ruins sitting for, you know, sometimes hundreds of years, the ruins remain. That isn't what happened here. This is very unique. Alexander came down to Tyre, the people of Tyre said, Alexander, we're not going to submit to you. Who are you, Alexander? And they said, hey, hey, we're, we, we got this island out in the Mediterranean Sea, Alexander. And they went out to the island, and they say, hey, Alexander, you can't get us. We're out here in the ocean. You don't have any boats. And they had a few boats, but not. you can't get us out here. And so therefore, Alexander's on the coast saying, wait a minute, i got to take the city. These people are offending me. And so he basically said, OK. They've got the city of Tyre that was on the coastland, and Alexander then takes the stones from the city and throws them into the ocean. Takes more stones, throws them in the ocean, and he makes a causeway out to the island, fills in the ocean, goes out to that island, and where does he get the stones for making that causeway? He gets it from the city of what was formerly called Tyre. He flattens the city, just like the Bible said, it would be flat as a fisherman. He takes the stones of the city, throws them into the ocean, and gets out to that island, and to this day, if you go to Google Maps and you go in, in to, to Lebanon, just north of Israel, maybe 30, 40 miles, you'll notice there's a little like zit or, or a pimple sticking out into the Mediterranean Sea. That's Tyre, and, and that's the causeway that Alexander built back then out to that island. And you can see it just kind of sticks out into the Mediterranean Sea. You can see it on Google Maps even till this day. It uh, remains there. So Alexander, by the way, you wouldn't want to be out on that island when Alexander gets out there. It's like these people, you wouldn't want to be in their shoes. But anyways, Alexander takes Tyre, but it took Alexander, was a six or eight months, six or eight months. Out of 10 years, he's going to conquer the whole world. He spent six or eight months taking Tyre, just that one place. And actually, in doing so, fulfilling the scripture in some sense, there's in the Tyre prophecy in Ezekiel, it's a multiple fulfillment thing. You've got to work with, uh, you know, many times 
things happen and it was layered. It was layered and it's more complex than when I'm making it out. I realize that. But Alexander had a big part in flattening that city and stuff. Now, by the way, is Alexander going to get along with the Jews? Yeah, the Jews run out and say, hey, Alexander, look at that. You took down Tyre just like our Bible says. Ezekiel said it would be flattened. You flattened it. And Alexander says, hey, the Jews are pretty good people. And so Alexander didn't mess with the Jews. He just went shoom, down to Egypt. The Jews were mostly up in the mountains. He didn't have to worry about them. And so he goes down into Egypt. When he goes down to Egypt, he gets to a place called Siwa. And this is the place, remember, Cambyses had trouble with. And what this happens here is people begin to say that when he got to Egypt, see, in Egypt, the Pharaoh was considered a god. In Egypt, the Pharaoh was considered a god, that the Pharaoh was a god or the son of a god, whereas in Mesopotamia, the king was a representative of the god. And so there was two different structures. Alexander gets in Egypt, hey, the king is a god, and so he starts getting this, his head starts getting bigger at this point. Uh, the Siva place, some people think that's where he got the first idea that he was, that he was divine, something like that. He then takes Egypt, he goes back then, he's got to go back out of Egypt, cross Israel, up through Syria, and he goes over and takes Babylon. Now when he takes Babylon, he ends up marrying this woman called Roxanne. Now this is important because he, he's Greek, but yet he's marrying a Mesopotamian woman. Alexander is getting one of the first people to have this notion of globalization. And so what he does is he makes an opsis, what's called an opsis banquet. And in this opsis banquet, Basically, he invites people from all the different countries that he had, had dominated, he invites them to this banquet and kind of this universal banquet, this diverse, culturally diverse banquet where all these people come from all these different countries to eat in Alexander's presence and stuff. And so this is, this is the notion actually very early of this notion of conquering the whole world, globalization. It starts Alexander's doing this and things. But what's the problem? He's telling his troops, hey, we've been away from home. His troops are saying, we've been away from home for eight, 10 years now. Man, we're getting tired of this, Alexander. And Alexander says, hey, don't think about going back to Greece. Intermarry with the people here. Well, the Greeks don't want to hear that. These guys say, I've got a wife and kids at home. I don't want to intermarry with anybody here. And so Alexander says, no, intermarry and stuff. So his troops start getting a little bit antsy and things because of the intermarriage. And frankly, Alexander is drunk quite a bit. That's why I call him Alexander the Grape because he ends up drinking a lot and things, and he's drunk and, and things. His troops are, again, his troops losing respect for Alexander in some senses, uh, just because he's not, uh, you know, he's, he's doing this intercultural thing rather than saying Greek is the best kind of uh, role. So things start going down. Uh, he takes all the way over to the Hindish Kush Mountains, and basically over through Afghanistan, over in Pakistan, Alexander takes that whole area. Now, my son tells me that he takes Afghanistan, but the Afghanis say, no, no one's ever conquered us. That actually, the rumor has it that the, how he took the Afghans was he married one of the Afghan princesses, and so therefore they didn't fight. They kind of formed this alliance rather than being conquered by Alexander. So I don't know, I've got to research that more in terms of the histor historicity of that, but that's at least the Afghani side of thing. Alexander didn't conquer them. He intermarried with them. And so that's interesting as well. But nevertheless, Alexander did dominate that whole area all the way over to the um, Indus River and uh, basically the Persian Empire. So 10 years, Alexander takes the whole, the whole bailiwick. Now, there's these cultural amalgamations now. You've got Greek culture, you've got Egyptian culture, you've got Mesopotamian culture, you've got Aryan culture in, in Iran and beyond to the Afghanistan and things. And so there's this... Uh, this movement beyond the Greek polis. The Greek polis, polis means city, like metropolis. Polis means city. And the Greeks were city-states. They were city-states. And uh, basically, you've got movement now beyond the city-state to this whole like universal empire. And uh, Alexander is putting this together, this notion of globalization, where Greek language could be spoken in Athens, and you could speak the Greek language over in Babylon, and you could speak the Greek language down in Egypt. And therefore, they, oh, the whole world began to speak the Greek language and be aware of Greek culture and that kind of thing. This then becomes very important for the New Testament is the language. And with the language, oftentimes comes a worldview, a way of looking at the world through the language that one speaks. And so what you have is this switch then from an Eastern Semitic Hebrew and Aramaic language over to a Western Hellenistic, what's called Koine Greek. Let me just go off on that a little bit.